We are joined today by some amazing folks. We're joined by Karen Henning and Libby Van Wy. And also, um, Jack will also be sharing as well. Um, so all three of our wonderful of our wonderful friends here will be sharing. Quick disclaimer that um, that as you know, we are we are learning from from real life examples from real life people who have had their experiences. It's not meant to be um, like uh, none of us are medical people who are officially medical people. I don't even know what the term is anymore. Like we don't work for the DSM. So so um, the thing is that the, these are individual experiences. Um, and so we are thankful to have you here sharing with us about these experiences that you have. And, um, and we welcome questions, encouragement, and we're here and, and, and support. This entire room of people we have here today is here to support each other and also to really honor the experiences that Karen, Libby, and Jack are sharing with us. So if it's agreeable, we thought we could start out by having each of them share a bit about their life and, and their thoughts about the subject of, of neurodivergence. And then um, following that, we have some questions to pose so that we can talk into breakout rooms. But first, we'd like to give each of them about 15 or 20 minutes to talk about their experiences. Um, Karen, would it be all right if we start with you? Sure, we can do that. So my name is Karen Henning, um, and I have ADHD. I was in the first wave of diagnoses in the early 80s when they were still insisting girls did not have it. So that should let you know how profound my symptoms were. Um, at that time, they were still under the impression that stimulant medication was the way to go. They have since found out that that is not the proper medication to give to ADHD individuals under the age of about 28 to 30. And this is all new knowledge that I have gotten in the last year and a half because I am finally properly medicated. And um, dealing with ADHD through high school and then not being medicated until just recently for, for most of my adult life and trying to just power through has made me very keenly aware when I work with my younger learners in after school programs or older learners who have a similar story to mine, um, I recognize those things that it would have been helpful to have an adult or somebody in charge acknowledge and find support or provide support for. Um, I am now in a position to do that and I am absolutely profoundly grateful for it. The medication has been so life-changing that I seriously wonder these days how I functioned without it. I, I just, I have no clue how I functioned without it. Well, I didn't, I was very busy, but I wasn't actually getting any one thing done. What ADHD in my case, is it's more of a self-motivation, um, planning and problem solving issue. Um, the procrastination is very, very high with me. Um, I have to literally plan and make time and sit down and spend about 10 minutes diving in before the brain kicks in and says, oh, this is interesting, we're into this, let's continue. So I have to find ways to kickstart myself. And I see this in my students very often as well. Um, my understanding with the, the current picture of ADHD, um, there's about seven points that they look at to make a diagnosis. Um, there's, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at notes here because I don't hold these things in my memory. Self-awareness, inhibition, nonverbal working memory. And this means mental imagery, visualization. Verbal working memory, which is the inner monologue, emotional self-regulation, self-motivation, and planning and problem solving. 
Um, people with ADHD have a brain structure and a genetic predisposition that has been created either while their brain was forming or created through head trauma. And Lord knows where I fall in that because I have both of those things. The age that my parents were when they had me um, is strongly um, implicated in my adult ADHD. Um, it's, uh, there's an extra gene that we just have more of that bypasses all of this executive function that is needed for sitting, paying attention, really deciding to focus on one specific thing or two specific things. Um, now you put something that's interesting in front of me, anything, any kind of nature documentary, any natural history museum, anything like that, all through my childhood and all through adulthood. Those are the things that I will be laser focused on. And this is why nature journaling has, has become a big part of my practice. I've been drawing since I could hold a pencil and that will definitely engross me. Um, it's a little more difficult if it's a commissioned piece, if I'm doing a scientific illustration as a commission, um, I love the work, but if it's not my idea specifically, the that part of the brain activates and, and I have to use a few workarounds to get into it. I see this with my kids when we're doing things either with new materials, um, but mostly when we're outside. Um, the most... Uh, God, the most recent story that's really awesome was when we did an event walk and one of my kids found a salamander. And instantly, everybody was laser focused on that redback salamander. And kids who had just been all over the place, not necessarily engaging, not very interested. And I never pushed them. I, I told them, you know, I want you to be doing something with all of these materials and resources we have here. But I'm not going to raise my voice at you or tell you you're doing anything wrong, but I need you to be engaging in some way. So they do that on their terms. Soon as that salamander came up, there were kids talking about how it, how it breathed through its skin. So we needed to be careful. We needed to put it back quickly. Um, there were other kids talking about, oh, I've seen this in my backyard. I've also seen this and this. Everybody suddenly had a story because it was something in nature that had gotten their attention and they all wanted to share. And it wasn't that they were showing off what they knew, um, which is something that ADHD people are um, generally known for. It's not that we're showing off, it's that we overshare and then we continue to overshare. <laughs> even when we may have those social cues telling us, you know, you, you should really like rein this back because we really are interested in what we're talking about. So being able to give them that space to do that after recognizing what was happening um, was just a wonderful moment. Um, and I'm not sure that I would have recognized what was going on specifically as a hallmark of the, the neurodivergence, because I think out of, gosh, 12 kids, 10 had some sort of diagnosed neurodivergence. Um, and just knowing to look for that or recognizing something in these kids that I had experienced and I had moved through the world doing myself um, was, was incredibly empowering for me. And it made me really make sure that I passed that empowerment on to them. Um, I don't want any kid going through what I did, you know, um, we're not lazy. We're not unmotivated. We're not any of the things that, uh, we generally get labeled as, 
you know, difficult, not paying attention. Um, we are perfectly able to do all of these things when the condition is managed correctly. But when you're a kid, it's very easy for an authority figure to see that behavior and think, oh, well, you're just being a kid and you need to kind of start growing up a little. And it's it's not that these kids can't do this. Um, it's that their brain will not allow them to do it. And there needs to be intervention. So that is probably very, very rambling. I'm hoping I stayed on somewhat of a, a clear path. Thank you, Jack. Um, that is why I am here is to help get those those cues to be recognizable. And when you see somebody who, who may be tuning out or may be on the outskirts, um, physically, mentally, emotionally, to have those tools in the toolbox to, you know, we'll try this to get them included. We'll try this, we'll try this. Um, but if you don't have any of those tools because you just don't know, you haven't been told, um, I mean, that's, if if I did not share that with you, I would be doing a disservice to this community. So that is why I am here today. We are so glad that you're here today. Thank you so much, Chair. I always want to say Chair, and I'm so sorry, Karen. Karen, thank you so much, Karen. Um, for sharing that with us, because like what you said about making sure that the kids get to experience these things on their terms and that they get to be understood and, and on their terms and not labeled such horrible and destructive things to their internal, like, I'm so glad that you're here to tell us about, like, to, to make us more aware. <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, look at me getting emotional. Like, Thank you for for making us more aware about this, um, because we would like really to make sure that we are there for our kids the way that the way that I really wish that we'd been there for you or that adults had been there for you when you were a kiddo. Um, before we go to Libby, um, Billy Joe, are there any comments in the chat? Um, because I saw that there were some really like people were responding. So. Um, yeah, there was just a, a sort of a question, uh, not really questions, but there was uh, just a comment about like labels and, um, you know, maybe there is, you know, some of the issues are with labels. Um, but the a point I made is I've gone through some of this with my own daughter and that without the labels, unfortunately, there's no supports in the school system. So you kind of have to have the label in order to get the supports. And without the label, you also don't get the um the medication, but I think that the labels need to be understood so that they're not being classified as lazy. They're not being classified. So it's the understanding of the labels and that the labels are there to support the kiddos and to support the parents. Um, in my own experience, I've learned so much in the last year um, just by understanding um, what's happening. And I'm only, you know, I don't even know as everything, right? Because everybody is so different, even if you have the same diagnosis. So I think that was the the big thing is just sort of the labels, right? Because I know a lot of parents can get really scared about having the label um, and then that following their child. Um, but I, you know, just that piece is the the support. The support is a really big thing. And I think maybe Karen, you want to sort of add something to that. Without the label, I am the lazy, irresponsible kid. I am neither of those things and neither are my ADHD kids. When, when the label is properly applied, it means that you don't have a lack of willpower. You're not acting out. It means there is a difference in how your brain is working and people who know that this difference is there through the label can meet you where you are. makes sense that way the label in that case is sort of saying this is something that somebody might need or you know this is this um, this is somebody who needs support as opposed to the other labels that aren't diagnosis that instead are the unkind labels and I still struggle with that you know I'll have a bad day and I still hear parent teacher in my head saying well you're just lazy and irresponsible 
I still struggle with that. I'm going to be 52 this year. So, you know, I don't want any of my kids getting to the age that I am still having that in their head. Because that's, it's, it can be crippling when the days are bad. Definitely. Thank you. Um, is there, um, sh um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, is there, sh should we come back to talk, um, like at the end of when, of when Karen Libby and Jack, um, speak, should we have a little Q and A before we go into breakout rooms? Just if anybody wants to say other things too. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to come back to talk more about this. And so, um, we'd love to hear Libby about your story. And also, I apologize if I said your last name incorrectly. No, that's fine. Um, I pronounce it Van Wy. Van Wy, okay. Awesome. Um, thank you, um, everybody. My name is Libby. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm an environmental educator for the last, um, oh, almost 20 years, like 18 or some years. And I've been doing um, nature journal facilitation with students for about the last four. Um, I'm a big proponent of these like techniques, especially to help neurodivergent students um, interact with the content and understand their place in the world more deeply. And I currently work for Oregon State University Outdoor School. So one of the things that I'm pushing for now is using nature journaling to support students moving into an outdoor school experience, which is an amazing state funded thing that we have in Oregon, but a lot of students aren't emotionally or mentally ready and find it really challenging, find it to be a really big leap. Um, so I personally, um, I late realized and still as yet undiagnosed, um, high masking autistic person. So they call that sometimes high functioning, but I prefer to say high masking because um, I've learned techniques to keep my neurodivergency like hidden from the world. And I'm so good at it that I even managed to keep it hidden from myself um, for a really long time. Um, so just to preface this by saying, they have a saying that when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Like every single person <laughs> is completely different. Um, but there's all kinds of neurodiversity even in this room today. And mine is just like one, one story. So, what I kind of want to talk about is how my upbringing kind of had this interesting intersection between nature deficit disorder and neurodivergency. Um, I grew up in a family that had a lot of fear. And looking back on it now, I think the things they were most afraid of were nature and having a kid who was somehow weird or impaired. <laughs> you, you put those two things together. And um, I ended up with what I now completely understand is nature deficit disorder. Um, it explains a lot of my health issues and anxiety issues. I went into environmental education to kind of work through that for myself and to help, um, you know, using nature to heal both myself and students. Um, but that wasn't really the whole story. And I'm only recently beginning to be honest with myself about the rest of the story um, because I realized that I've been, um, masking probably for my parents benefit for a long long time um to the point where I'm not even really sure exactly how much of the personality that I present is the real me and how much is like autistic masking um but I haven't been diagnosed and I think it's possibly because you know people can go undiagnose their whole lives because it doesn't fit the mold of what people think autism looks like um because I can interact socially, but only because I'm running like really sophisticated, like PhD level calculus on all the interactions that I'm having at all times. So there's a limit to how many spoons I have to do that, to look human. Um, and I'm, you know, as I get older, there are things that meant that I reached the limit of my spoons. Um, I am very sensitive to all kinds of sensory stuff, including kind of a sixth sense that I have about what people are feeling around me. And so all of those senses are like turned up to 11. Um, and that fuels my, uh, my highly sophisticated program that I use to navigate the world and interact with people. Um, 
So when you put that realization that I'm on the spectrum together with the fact that I already knew that I had nature deficit disorder, it makes my, it makes things make a whole lot of sense. I see myself when I was a kid begging my parents to be allowed to play in nature. And I realized that what I was begging for was sensory regulation. Like I was begging to have my sensory needs met by nature because nature is really the only thing that is at the right speed, the right color, the right texture, the right amount of light, the correct volume for my my brain and my nervous system. Um, so I use nature to like stave off autistic meltdowns like that you're going to have if you're masking all the time, you're going to you're going to reach a limit and then nature is how I self-regulate. Um, so, you know, I think environmental education and doing nature journaling with students has really helped me, um, because in addition to like offering this quiet, reflexive time in nature where all my sensory needs are getting met and I'm in a quiet meditative space and cultivating that for others means that I can cultivate that for myself. So like, we're all healing all at the same time. So in addition to the self-regulation and the quiet space, there's also a lot of social emotional learning that I am getting and the students I work with are getting, um, especially for autism spectrum folks who kind of need some help with those SEL competencies, um, like self-awareness. So even though I can sense how a room full of people are, you know, kind of feeling. I may not have words to describe my own feelings, and that's called alexithymia. Um, so it doesn't mean that I don't have feelings or that I'm not even, maybe I'm aware of what I'm feeling, but I can't describe it to another person in a way that is going to make sense to a neurotypical. So one of the things I like to do is incorporate a feeling check-in into the metadata. Um, and as you're capturing information about the outside world. I'm constantly encouraging students to capture information about what's going on inside them at the same time. So you can use words, you can use pictures, you can use numbers, what's going on inside and be a scientist looking inward as well as looking outward. Um, and that's huge. That's been a huge challenge for me. And I think it's really, really healthy for people who are on the spectrum. And also in the SEL kind of realm, of building relationships and relationship skills, which can be really challenging. Um, as someone who kind of feels like the other humans are freaking insane sometimes, and like I can't figure out what anybody wants or what they're doing, and like stuff's making no sense to me. But one of the things that does make sense to me, you know, is a connection between myself and like the more than human world and other organisms and building relationships with other organisms is simple, it's soulful, it's concrete. It just made sense to me. So I could like, you know, if I was struggling with human interaction or building friendships, I could encourage myself and the students. Who am I talking about now? I'm talking about myself and students. The pronouns are shifting. Um, but I would encourage you to like look at that relationship with the object you're journaling about as a relationship that you can actually build that has long term value, even though it's not with another human the way that we normally think about it. Um, you know, if you don't know how to talk to strangers, I encourage you to personify nature, use creative personification to like personify the thing that you're journaling about so that you can build a relationship with it. Um, so let's see, another thing about it that has really helped me is that it has counteracted my perfectionism and the belief that like there's one right way to do things. And I'm trying to figure what, figure out what that is all through my life. But nature journaling is the opposite of that because there are numerous different ways to engage with the material and there's not one right way to journal and, you know, it's really flexible. So for people, it kind of has a little bit of everything, like for autistics who really need clear instructions and need like clear, succinct, clear understanding of what is expected of them, you can give them that, but you can also work with people who have maybe oppositional defiance disorder by giving options, you know, if you feel like you want to resist this assignment, there are these options and you can pick whichever one you want. Um, and I just love that, you know, the big take home message for me is that everything that we do and create and everything that we are in the world, it's okay for none of our experiences and none of our journal pages to be the same. Like we're all so diverse and 
that really helps me like nature journaling has helped me appreciate that and you make space for that for kids so that's kind of that was kind of what I wanted to say does anybody have any questions I'm looking to see if there are any hands uh, there's no hands, um, but one person did say in the chat that um, uh, Libby, you are communicating your situation and a way of moving through the world so beautifully and effectively. It is resonating so much. So I just wanted to um, shout that out. Thank you so much for making that connection with being able, like not only nature journaling, regulating yourself and, but also being able to look inside and treat, like finding out what those feelings are like an investigation um, and using the journal as that tool is so beautiful for kid for kids who need that space and that permission to do that and that guidance. Um, those are some beautiful, beautiful tools that you're sharing with your students. Avea Marley has his hand up. Um, so I'm just going to ask him to unmute. He doesn't have his video on. Oh, there you does. are. Yeah, there he is. I'm going to put him in the spotlight. There we go. Um, thank you for sharing everybody who shared so far. I have a um, an autism spectrum question. Um, and I never thought that I was potentially on the autism spectrum until um, someone that I was uh, hanging out with and geeking out about reptiles with randomly said uh, while we were hanging out, um, I hope that I haven't been a bad host um, because I, I just realized that I might be on the autism spectrum. So if you know, you're feeling weird at all. And I was like, oh, I've just been having like a really great time geeking, totally geeking out about reptiles with this guy. And so then I started like looking stuff up and then my question, though, is um, something that's happened to me is I'll be with like a group of people and um, everybody's like talking about something that um, I'm suddenly like very aware that I'm not interested in or I start having this feeling like I don't belong there because everybody's talking about like some usually like popular culture topics or um, emotional topics and suddenly I'm like, uh, I'm, you know, and then I feel bad that I'm not like interested in that. Or the other thing that happens is I'll be, um, and this is my question is, um, people I'll be in a conversation and someone's saying something that's really important to them, like emotionally. And then suddenly I see a parasitoid wasp fly by and I'm like suddenly like very interested in that. And I go to look at it and then I've gotten in trouble. Like people have gotten really mad at me before for doing that. So I guess my question is, is um, if anybody here, um, uh, you know, Libby or others have any like ideas about how to kind of navigate that feeling of like, oh, I should be interested in this or I should be like, you know, trying to like care about this, but then also like, recognizing that it's okay that we're interested more in the is it okay for me to be interested more in the wasp than that person's feelings I guess is is the question I think that's so interesting the way you're phrasing it because the question is is it okay is it okay that your brain operates differently is it okay that you don't respond in the same way to social cues that other people do or that you're interested in things that other people aren't as interested in and it just sucks that we have to ask whether it's okay to be like our own brains in the world that's my first first reflection <laughs> is that 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 sucks a little bit um and I feel it too because if I could I could I would download my brain program into your I'm like I have a whole sophisticated way of telling in the situation based on other people's body language exactly whether or not it is appropriate for me to look away at this moment and check out check out the wasp and if i read that it's not then this is how i'll handle it and i'll store it for later and then <laughs> it's complicated it's complicated being me um and I, and I know that other people feel that same way you're like i'm drawn to be myself but i'm also masking to be what people expect in a social situation. Karen, you said something before about um, Mac operating systems trying to integrate with um, Windows operating systems. And I think that's really a, a really accurate 
Yeah, if you're, you're operating in a Windows world um, running Mac OS and and it, it just it doesn't work well. Um, and I oh man, it it hurts my heart to hear people wonder if, if it's okay for them to be the people that they are. I mean, this is who you are, Marley, and you're not somebody who is consciously or deliberately hurting somebody's feelings. You are putting your interests first, and I think that is completely valid. Now, if you want to go back later and explain to this person why that transaction went the way that it did. I mean, that is perfectly up to you. That might be a, a way to, to wrap that situation up so you can put it aside and move on. But I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with doing what you have described. I have done that many, many, many times. And when I did it in a school setting, it was, well, she doesn't pay attention. She needs to learn to apply herself. Oh, I was applying myself. I was applying myself to the, the fungus that was growing on the lawn over there because I just wasn't interested in what was being taught in a classroom. So yeah, it's um, sometimes you need to meet yourself where you are too. And uh, yeah, it is it is totally okay for you to go look at that wasp. I would be the one right behind you going, oh, where is it? Can I see? So yeah. Um, so Marley, does that give you some answer to your question? Yes, okay. <laughs> Um, and I, we see, re oh, yes. Could I tag on to that too? Um, Marley, see. I really identify with what you're saying. Uh, perhaps my most, um, an, an extreme example of that for me is that at one point I was uh, dating a wonderful woman who was a performance artist. And um, she would do these one woman plays about aspects of her life. And at one point, um, after we had uh, had broken up, she decided to do a, a a a woman woman play about all of the relationships that she had been, and kind of the train wrecks of 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 men who she had dated, and I got to be in the play. Um, that I was the only one who didn't really come off as a jerk. I was more of a a quirky anecdote, but it was the story of the day after a rainstorm at the Bovary Preserve. We went for a hike and uh, she wanted to talk about our relationship and it was a really important conversation. This coincided with an emergence of red-bellied newts that were all coming down and there were hundreds of them. I've never seen so many red-bellied newts. I mean, it was really, really, really cool. But like I had to count them all <laughs> and, 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 uh, that made it into the one woman show. So, uh, I, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> Some other time I want to know about those red bellied newts. Just saying <laughs> everybody here was like, everybody here, I could see the interest in everybody's faces here. You're not alone in that. All of us want to know about the red-bellied newts. It looked as though Rebecca had an answer to Marley as well. Hi. So, yeah, I have a couple thoughts I'd like to add in to Marley's question. So, um, similar to Libby, I don't have a diagnosis, but I am pretty sure I, I'm on the autism spectrum as well. Um, well and like Libby said in the chat, one of my thoughts was, get other neurodivergent friends who will get it, who won't be offended. Um, it's a great option, um, not always possible, um, but I think the other big thing is like, like everybody's been saying, it's okay that, you know, our brains work a little differently than the norm. Um, but also I think 
all of the judgment that's associated, even when we're like, oh, it's okay to be different, but like, oh, I should be doing it this way. I should pick up on these social cues. I should act this way. Like, it's all just kind of made up if you think about it. Of like, what's what's a what what all our ideas about what's appropriate are just based on a very particular culture that prioritizes, uh, you know, neurotypical people, which is just just kind of an average that is all made up anyway um and that i think in it's a lot more useful instead of thinking about like what you should do or what's appropriate but just thinking about that everybody has we all have needs that we're trying to get met in any one particular time and um like I just read the book Nonviolent Communication, which is really, really good. But a big part of that is just like paying attention to what your needs are, what other people's needs are, communicating that. And I think that like, for example, if someone has a need in a moment to talk about something important with their emotions, like the other person they're talking to might not be in the right place to have that conversation with them. And that's true whether you're neurodivergent or not. Like somebody would be like, oh, hey, I've had a long day or like I, whatever, or you don't even need to give an excuse, which is like, I'm just not really in the right frame of mind. Like I'm just not really in, interested in having this conversation right now, but like, you're my friend. I care about you as a person. Can we chat another time? Or like, I'm just, it's, I think it's totally fair to just be like, hey, I care about you, but I'm just not really the person to have this conversation with you to help you process this in the way that you need. I've got these needs. And to just be clear about that. And I think, honestly, I think that's one thing that autistic people or neurodivergent people do a lot better than neurotypical people is being direct and just saying what they think. Because I think it's not really fair for people to not say what they need and just expect other people to pick up on that. And I guess neurotypical people work that way. I don't really get it. But I think, I think if somebody has a need, they should just be able to say that outright and or make a request and say like, hey, can we do this? And you can say no. And um. Yeah, that's true for all kinds of situations. So I think, yeah, just <clears throat> everybody being clear about what they need and being being direct about that. I all think also, um, you know, whether if some if for people who are comfortable with being open about things, I think like when you make a new friend. Or, or in a situation just being like, hey, I'm autistic, or you know, if you're not sure or you don't have a diagnosis, just being like, hey, this is how I've noticed how my brain tends to work. And this, if I see a parasitoid wasp, I will get distracted. It's nothing personal, <laughs> but that's what's going to happen. And then we'll be like, oh, okay, cool. I'm like knowing to expect that. Like I made a new friend a couple weeks ago who when we first met, was just like, oh, hey, I'm autistic. So if I'm, I'm not good at small talk and if it seems like I'm just staring into space, like it's nothing personal, that's just kind of how I work. And I'm like, okay, cool. And um, I just, and again, we have to interact with a lot of different people in our lives. People don't always get it, but I think it's one of those things where like the people who are worth having in your life will get it. A really good way to put it that the people who, especially as your relationship grows, the more we understand each other and the more we really get each other. And so then it's about learning and and embracing who each of us are with all of our parts and all of the different ways that we work because we, we learn each other, we learn how each other works and it's we don't all work the same. And that's part of the beauty of life. We don't have to work the same. Thank you. Um, before um, before we go on to hearing Jack's story, um, is there anything else that people would like to say at this point in their conversation? I want to make sure that I'm not interrupting anybody. No? Okay. Um, 
Jack, would you like to share about your experience? Um, I would love to. Um, but also, it is really interesting to be here in this conversation. Um, and it is making me think about my my own experience in really, really different ways. And uh, there is, for all of us, there's there's just such a, a wide diversity of how how our brains can possibly do things in this world. I wonder if even the term, you know, like typical people it, it isn't a thing that um, but th th this is giving me a, a lot more to, to 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 really more sort of personally unpack and I'm really really grateful for 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 what you've been sharing. Thank you. Uh, so I'm dyslexic. Um, when I was a little guy, the term was freshly hatched. Um, I was, uh, it was nowhere in any teacher's vocabulary. Um, teachers in, in, in that day kind of <clears throat> knew that it was just putting your, your nose to the grindstone and, 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 and hard work. And then, and then that that will that will get us through. And if you're not doing that, then you're. Uh, it, it was sort of the, the the the. Are you familiar with the, the no to true Scotsman fallacy, you know that somebody says you know all all Scotsmen are brave, and somebody says well what about McTavish over there? He ran away from the fight. Well, he's no true Scotsman. So the idea that teachers had was that if you um if you were really trying then you would get it so therefore you're not really getting it so you're not really trying um or this or the the the, the real trying that you're doing isn't really real trying and um so i was um labeled as sort of the the stupid kid um my teachers tried lots of strategies, um, including, you know, public humiliation. Um, having you uh, sort of perform for the class or, or, or read things, um, uh, sort of publicly read to the class um, knowing that you would fail and then um, highlighting those. And so my response was to shut down and to fight back. And the way I fought back was to be the class clown. Um, if I could not be a part of this, I could be a very effective disruptor. And I I could disrupt like a boss. <laughs> the um, this was uh, before we were actively thinking about growth mindsets. In that you you have and you are where you are, and um, I could. I, there, there were well-meaning grown-ups around me who were saying, like, you know, you're a smart kid, um, but you know that your parents are supposed to say that, so you can discount that. I kind of had this little Occam's razor thing going in in my 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 brain, like, what is the what is the explanation for what I'm seeing that requires the first the the fewest kind of additional assumptions about what's what's going on that you know either like yeah you are this you are a really smart kid but somehow you can't do smart 
in the way that everybody around you can do smart and all these sort of objective ways like you don't know your multiplication tables you can't spell when you read out loud it sounds to us like you're reading a different book even though the covers of our books are the same um so when i would would read i would take words and i would change around my sentence and it would still kind of make sense when you listen to it but i was i had totally different things going on um so is it possible that there's some kind of thing going on where you're you're smart but you just can't do the smart um or is it require less assumptions just to kind of know that a lot of grown-ups say things that aren't real so I believed I was not smart. Um, and when you believe that, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to try. Um, all these things that you say about growth mindset, um, that if, if, if you don't have a good brain, why are you really knocking yourself out trying to do these things? trying to jump through these hoops that uh, you'll never be able to do. The sort of, I was realizing like, look, I'm a square peg in a, in, in a, in a, in a round peg world. So um, I was picked up by some researchers at UCSF. Um, I was one of the most extreme cases that they had seen. And I became Johnny Doe in a bunch of early dyslexia. Um, experiments of research. Um, so I, I really liked doing those because working with the people up there because they gave me pencils that said UCSF on them. And those were cool pencils. And they also was a pretzel stand out in front and every once in a while we'd go down and get a hot pretzel. And so I could do puzzles and there are pretzels and pencils. So uh, that got a lot of people their, their PhDs. Um, but they even tried to go to my teachers and explain what was going on. Um, sort of like, here's, here's what we're figuring out. This doesn't work. This is going on but but there was not a receptive audience um it wasn't until i was in high school that there were two teachers uh one was a, a history teacher named uh, leroy voto Another was a biology teacher named Alan Ridley, who saw past the narrative that by that point had been pretty well established. And they listened to my ideas and turned my world upside down. Um, For me, the big danger was I, I really believed I didn't have anything to, to offer or to share. Um, and I, I felt I had empirical evidence to back that up. The little sort of proto-scientist in me um, was able to look at the data that I thought I had, but through a lens that sort of started with me being a dumb kid. Um, throughout this, nature and nature journaling was a major source of solace and reconnection for me. Um, I carried a nature journal in my backpack and after school would wander through Golden Gate Park with my journal and go, I would, you know, crawl through the underbrush 
you know, tracking Rufus sided towies. I remember my, my, my first Rufus sided towie and, um, it was, it was this, this magical, magical thing. Um, and I knew all the birds, I knew all the birds in the park, um, by, by song. And, um, so I was, I was a, my, my dad was a bird watcher. My mom was a botanist. So I was, I was becoming a really solid little naturalist, but I didn't make any connection that that was a counter narrative to your stupid. Um, I was also a really, really good boy scout. Like I could do all those boy scout things. I think I still may hold the record for the fastest bull and tide in the San Francisco Bay area council. Um, if anybody out there thinks that they can beat me, I still got it. Um, so those, those sort of mechanical things, um, the, but still to this day, when I put stuff down in my journal, um, I notice that I almost always lead with drawing pictures because I remember the attack of the red pen. It is, um, and it is strange, no matter kind of how much grown uping I've done, um, sometimes it doesn't take much for me to be, uh, my brain to be back there in third grade. And um, retreating from the world in, in embarrassment about my, my inability to um, to do the tasks that other people around me, it just seems easy. Most of these books behind me, I've never read them, but I did look at the pictures and there's some cool parasitoid wasps. Um, and so that is one reason why I think I really love the idea and push the idea of growth mindset in our community. Um, that I like the idea of words, pictures, and numbers so that people can start where they are. And I really like the idea of that your words don't have to be spelled right in your nature journal. This is for you thinking. Um, your pictures don't have to be pretty. This is for you thinking. Um, and uh, that's a little bit about my experience. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Jack. Uh, I, um, I think I speak for all of us here when I say it really breaks my heart to imagine you being treated that way as a kid. It breaks my heart to imagine all all three of you here and also a bunch of you here in our group being treated that way as kids. I think the, the experience is so common. Yeah. And uh, um, you know, probably there are different aspects of this with, with the that resonate with just about everybody. And the thing that really gets... Oh, sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, no, I, I thought that Karen was... It's... Even to this day, it is so validating to hear stories like yours, because I, I saw myself in so much of what you were saying, and I was right there with you. I was just in a different spot, different part of the country, different school, different circumstances, but the reactions, the treatment, the labels, exactly the same. And I still struggle with it, but you know, I'm seeing what you're out doing in the world. It's a lot of amazing people that I know that I have the pleasure of knowing who went through this as kids and are doing amazing things out in the world. So it's thank you because I still need that validation from time to time. So thank you. Oh, you, you first, Libby, then I'll go. I was just thinking how beautiful it is what the people in this room have done with those experiences. 
developing systems of thinking that can help others. And it just gives me, maybe there's some hope that there was a reason for all of this that we went through because it, because we, people in this room were able to kind of turn that into something that could like honor other people honor kids' ways of thinking and give them a space to value what everybody has to yeah. offer. And I think I'm not quite at, I think that I'm really early on that journey because I'm only really re admitted to myself what's going on. And so I think as I come to a better awareness of what's really going on, maybe that'll give me the power to advocate more and speak up more and turn my like, and be more direct and intentional in the way that I'm teaching. And then what I notice about the way that other people who kind of realize that you were on this journey, probably a little earlier than I did, um, have already made great steps to include all kids and keep other kids from feeling this way. I think there was this one thing I read in this one Animorphs book. Um, once where one of the characters who was a kid was talking to his mom and his mom was sitting with him and saying that she had experienced much of the same that he did, but that she had two particular tools that he didn't have. One of them was that she'd survived all of those things, whereas he was still experiencing them for the first time and hadn't known he would survive them. And number two was that she had him, her son, and that when she thought, no matter how hard it got then, she could look at him going through the same things as a kid and think, I don't feel anywhere near what I felt back then. When we think about our kids going through these things, we think about kids who don't have that experience yet knowing that they're going to survive. That's what's heartbreaking, is knowing that the kids don't know that it can get better. Because the kids, the adults that are in the kids' lives aren't showing them that it can get better. I was hearing what Jack was saying about how we have our parents who, if, if we have our parents who are supportive, then we might not necessarily know that that support is like, we think that that's what they're supposed to say, whereas the teachers in those positions of power are crushing those kids. And that hurts. Because thinking about having that done to you every single day, the fact that any of us can think beyond what those lessons were that we had pounded into us as kids that we fight back is a miracle. Whenever we think about how, whenever we fight that message, every time that message comes back, being taught that we're not enough or too weird or too much or not smart, yeah. every time you fight back against that is incredible, considering how much time those adults had to pound those lessons in. So props to all three of you for surviving and also for making sure that the kids under your care don't have to feel the same way. Um, if it's at all helpful to people, um, before we continue on, before we go to maybe a bit more question and answer and then to breakouts if we have time, can I suggest something? And people don't have to do this, but this is just if it's helpful. If people find it helpful, you can either write it into the chat or turn off your screen and say it out loud. Two things. First, all of those things that people said that hurt you, that are in your head right now, get them out of yourself. Write them into the chat. We'll press send all at once just to say goodbye to those horrible things that people said. We know that they'll come back, but right now, just for right now, we're saying goodbye to those things. And we'll say we'll we'll press enter. And then after that, we'll write down all of the positive messages we want to let in. Maybe something positive. Well, first start out with the things that hurt you, but then we'll go to a positive message. Maybe something that a parent said to you, something that a friend said to you, something a fellow educator said to you, something a kid said to you, something that you would, if, if you can't think of the things that people would say to you, think of the thing that you'd want to say to your kid who would be in your same shoes. How's that sound? Okay. I like that idea. So again, we're writing into the chat just any um, things that our younger self may have heard that we want to let go. Yeah, we'll do that first.
Are we going to do a chat waterfall? Yes, we'll do that. So we won't press in just yet. We'll give people one more minute and then we can press it all at once just to get all of that yuckiness out of us. Do people need more time or are we ready? I'll give us a few more seconds. Okay. If folks are ready, before we press send, first take one deep breath in. Deep breath out. And prepare to say goodbye to those things. When you click Send if you, it even helps you say goodbye out loud. Goodbye. Another deep breath in. Another deep breath out. Let's take one more minute now and let's write down the positive things that we want to remember. Either the things that you've told yourself, the things that your parents told you, the things that a kind teacher told you, the things that your kids tell you now, or your friends, or the people in this room. And you don't have to stop at one. Say many if you'd like. If you're having trouble, then I'll say some kind words to you right now. Think about all of the kind, the things that are inside of you. Think about the person you've become who cares for other people. Think about how you survived, how every single time you do something incredible, you're, you're putting the lie to all of the negative things anybody else ever said. Think about how you've got an entire room of people here who want to hear your voice. Think about how many more amazing things you're going to do because your time's not done. We'll give people one more minute and then we'll, when we press send then, we'll say come in to those messages. We'll say come in instead of goodbye. But I'll give people one more minute. Are people good? Ready? All right. Before we do this, deep breath in. Deep breath out. One more deep breath in. Deep breath out. And as you press send, say come in. How y'all doing? Doing a bit better? Take time to read those if you need to. So just, just I'm observing the time and I know that we were going to have breakout rooms, but I also wanted to make sure that if anybody had questions, 
that they wanted to share here in the room with everybody that we could do that or or comments. Um, Jack, what do you think about our time? Well, maybe we um, just go around and see if anybody has any questions, comments, thoughts, or ideas they wanted to share into the conversation. And um, if there's time, give people a chance to speak with each other in the breakout rooms a little bit. So basically that's not very helpful. Do everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> but maybe first let's just give people an opportunity who are, are here and it, it's not too large a group here. Um, is there anybody uh, who would want to, to, to share a thought, a comment, an idea or an experience? And Libby, I'd seen that you unmuted for a moment too. And then I see Laura. Oh, I was just going to say, I was feeling so connected with everybody in the group right now that if we don't get into smaller groups, that's okay with me because I feel like I'm hearing such good stuff from the room if it's not a huge group. So, awesome. Thank you. Laura, welcome. Can you? Oh, there you are. There we go. I always push when you're pushed and then... <laughs> I just, um, I guess I wanted to share because I, I, I would like the nature journaling to be more of a bomb is that um, one of my particular neurodivergences is that I have something called aphantasia where I don't, can't visualize things in my head. And I need some hints on how to do things, how to capture things. And right, because they don't, I mean, I do okay with plants because they don't move that much. <laughs> at least not at the time. But um, I, I want to be able to do more and it's not there in front of me anymore. And then I can't picture it and I can't, um, so I do, I mean, I take pictures, but the, the pictures never look the same. They're not the same as what you're seeing. Uh, I don't, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, and then it, didn't, then it kicks into the other stuff where I'm intimidated about it not being good enough, even though I know that's not where I'm supposed to go. I, you, you know, but um, yeah, I can't picture things I can't close my eyes and imagine things I can't I couldn't close my eyes and picture my own kids faces um and so there's a little extra bit of uh stress sometimes when I'm trying to journal that I would like to find a way to embrace my difference and make it a more, I, I, yeah, better, joyful, ah, kind of thing. So anybody have any ideas? I see, I see Karen raising her hand, but go ahead. I, I totally feel you. I have uh, had two major closed head injuries from car accidents and I have had my ability to visualize deteriorate over the last 25 years. It's, I can have an image in my head, but it's like looking at it through a window that's got rain on it. So the shapes are there, but the details are, are not. Um, my workaround for that has been taking as much notes in words numbers diagrams that I possibly can about the things that really speak to me about what I have observed, what I am observing, and what I remember about it just before it left my line of sight. And I will combine that with photos, which of course they never look the way that they look when we're seeing it with our eyes. But I will take what I have because those are the, the pieces that I got to experience in the field and then I go and do my research and I look and see what other artists, what other biologists have had to, to say and what they've observed about 
that particular species or event or occurrence. And I will look to see what I recognize because it's in here just because I can't get the neurons together to make it crystal clear doesn't mean it's not in here. I will recognize it when I see it. So what I've started doing is compositing from all of those sources and putting together what ends up being my best guess. And sometimes it's got more there than what I knew I saw originally. But I mean, what a beautiful thing that nature journaling can do that for us, right? So it's it's a little more work for me to do it, but if it's something that I really want to have on the page so I can go back and look at it later, and I just really want that that memory, that that experience to stick, all of that extra legwork is is totally worth it to me. So your mileage may vary. That's you know, for everything we discuss here, but that is how I do it. And yeah, I, I understand the frustration. I understand the frustration because I had it. And now I don't. And I've had to find solutions for that. I didn't know I didn't have it until like five years ago. I didn't know that all of you actually had it. The rest of you had it. So just kind of weird. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Laura. And I'm seeing that Rebecca and, and Bethany are also raising their hands. Um, let's bring in Rebecca. Hi, um, so this is just a thought that came up for me, for you, Laura, um, while you were talking. Um, so I don't have aphantasia, so I can't really totally relate or understand um, to how it is that you experience it. Um, and mm, like your frustration was totally valid. Um, but one thing that I think about a lot in terms of, of everybody is that we all perceive things differently and different, like that's part of what neurodiversity is. And like, we all are have, you know, noticed things differently through our five senses. We all, and then those come into our brain and the way it gets processed and our brain happens differently for each of us. We all notice different things that are important or stand out to us. We all, when we take those observations, then we think about them. We all think about different things and have different things it reminds us of or things it makes us think about. Um, so, you know, every time each one of us, we could all nature journal the same flower and we'll all have totally different nature journal pages. And, you know, like even someone who's blind isn't gonna visualize anything at all ever. Um, and um, I just the way I, I always love to think about it is it's, I mean, that's kind of the whole thing about science in general, right? It's like, we're always trying to learn more of the truth of the universe, but there isn't just one singular truth that we can ever fully arrive at we all have a different perspective of it we each one of us has a different piece of the puzzle it's not about getting the right answer and the more we all share our own perspectives from our own brains then that's how we have the fullest picture um so that that's just something that i think about a lot i, I think it's true for everybody and I don't know if that helps you at all, but that's, um, your nature journal doesn't have to be the same way as anybody else's. But I want some pictures. <laughs> but I'm just realizing that my pollinator garden journal is actually a nature journal, um, even if it doesn't have any pictures in it. But, uh, and I do want to just say this, Rebecca, is I had a, a blind student and one of her greatest strengths was her ability to visualize. She yeah. could she could take what you said, told her or described to her and visualize it. We had fascinating conversations because I was like, I, how do we, you know, I can't visualize. She's like, oh no, I can, I can see things that she could see things in her head. I don't know what, I mean, 
I and I couldn't even conceive of what that meant because I don't see anything. So um there are more wonders in this world than we know. Well, thank you for correcting me. I also see Bethany. Um can we can we bring you on Bethany? Yeah, here we go. Um, hi, I, um, my brain is very, very visual, um, visual and um, as a child, I was diagnosed as dyslexic. Um, so um, when you were talking about not being able to visualize, it reminded me of a recent thing um, I'd come across with one of my students who um, has told me that they have dyspraxia. Um, and they were having terrible trouble with visualizing what was on top and what was underneath. And I was trying to do how to draw a bird's wing <laughs> and the sort of layering of the feathers. And they were just, um, they had a little bit of a mental meltdown. And I was like, no, don't do that. <laughs> we will find ways to help you. Um, and so I thought two of the things that I, I was coming up with, um, faster scene. <laughs> So this is my new favorite drawing tool is plasticine. So if you can't visualize it, you make it. Um, so I, I, I literally have this little ball that just sits here in my, my pot of pencils. And so I can, I can grab it quickly and then I can make the structure, or whatever it is. And I can get rid of this part. This feather is placed over top of this feather. And then I have I have it so it's nice and close to the camera so you can see and everything. And we make the thing. And I've done with this with with other subjects as well. So I had like a snake that was curled around um, a pole. And so we were trying to work out where the stomach was at each point. And so I made it. <laughs> and we were I was drawing on the plasticine so we could see the the stomach area as opposed to the back area. And, and wrapping it around and we were looking at it from different angles and so that that is my my new and I just wanted to share it that is my new best drawing tool um is is just plasticine and <laughs> um, and the other one that I have is this so if you have like a, a transparency um so I have a, a little bit of um OHP sort of perspex stuff um, this is sort of a, a, a board of um, acrylic or something, um, but it, you can put that on your window. So you can trace reality. <laughs> and what I do is if you've, if you've just got like a, one of these, you can stick it on your window, put tape around it so you're not going to go off the edge and draw it on your actual window. <laughs> um, but then you can you can sort of just keep your head in one position if you can and draw on your acetate um what you are seeing where it is and it is possible if you've got something like this and you can sort of make a stand and do stuff like that that you can put it in front of your flower um or whatever it is and try and and do it it's there is um i did sort of go to the sort of woodworking thing and try and make a big stand with an eye hole so you can set it all up um so if you look at camera lucida it's that kind of idea is that you've got the you've got the, the framework that you're drawing on you've got the eye hole um and you that's where you're gonna sort of keep your head position and you literally you just trace reality so there is no visualizing involved you are just seeing and you are drawing around it <laughs> so um i just wanted to share those two things that i um i've come up with um i was going to ask if anyone else had ideas for this particular student um with with dyspraxia but those are the things that i have come up with for them <laughs> awesome thank you bethany and i think that it looks like you have a responsibility joe um, it's slightly different, but I, I just wanted to say my <clears throat> experience working with um, some students um, who are neurodivergent um, and knowing that 
that their strengths at this point were not in paper to pencil um, is really just letting them know that that they can still nature journal. They're just going to nature journal out loud. And I really think that one of the most profound experiences, and, and I think I've said this before, was um, an autistic boy um, who I believe also had ADHD as well. Um, and I had known him for probably four years at this point. Um, and it was COVID and we were online and I was coming into their classroom. And at this point, um, we had these programs where the students who are neurodivergent were actually in separate classrooms. I personally thought it was a great space because it was one teacher with some uh, EA support in a very small group. Unfortunately, the school board has now de-streamed all of those classes and thrown those kids right back into the wolf pack of it all. Um, but at the time, this were really great. And so in the position I was in, I was able to go in once a month and, and work with all these students. And my job was to take them outside as the outdoor educator. And so I was doing lots of different things with them outside. Um, and then COVID hit. And so I was like, okay, well, what are we going to do? And so I thought, well, let, let's give nature journaling a shot. And I knew pen to paper wasn't going to be a, a popular thing with them. Um, and I, I said to the boy, I said, go, just go to the fridge and grab like something out of the fridge, you know, a fruit or a vegetable or whatever. And he says, like, I don't, I don't have anything. He's like, well, can I bring back an apple juice? And at that point I was like, sure, bring back an apple juice. And so he goes and uh, patters off to the fridge and he comes back and he goes, I found a grape. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And so that kid engaged with that grape for 45 minutes. And every time he asked me if he could do something, my answer was always, yes. Billy Joe, can I cut it open? Yes. Billy Joe, oh my gosh, I'm finding seeds. Can I cut them open? Yes. And so I think, you know, I think Karen kind of uh, men mentioned it earlier is, is sort of that autonomy piece, or maybe it was Libby who was saying like, uh, you know, ODD, I think it was Libby actually, giving options, right? And so for me, I'm always like, we do think differently, everybody thinks differently, and no two nature journals should ever look the same because the folks that are sitting in front of those pieces of paper are not the same people. And so it's always going to be different. And I think giving the autonomy over that space and over that learning, and I look at my job as a facilitator is just to give the permission that it's okay to just do it how they want to do it. And so I'm a very big proponent of that. There are no rules with nature journaling, but doing it the first time, I'm going to give you some structure. I'm going to give you some guidelines so that you have an idea of what you're doing, but I want you to take that and go for it. And then if there is a kid who's really struggling and, you know, Libby mentioned this earlier, but like with her autism is being able to like know what's happening on the page that I'm able to go to those kids and be like, here's a suggestion of how I would do this. And then giving them that place to go. Whereas another kid is already like onto the second page and I might not be able to read any of the writing on it, but it doesn't matter because that kid's thoughts are going crazy. And that's my position is just to encourage everything that's happening. Um, and really for me is not being in a formal education teaching position is to highlight those things for the teachers and be like, look at what's happening, look at what's happening, look at what's happening. And I've had many teachers be like, that's probably the most I've seen that kid write all year, right? And so being able to give them that space and time, but also having tools in my own toolbox. So if it's a kid that you're outside and, and they're not pen to paper kids yet, right? Yet, because they could become that if given the um the encouragement to do that but can you record their thoughts and can they work on writing it out later like i just think as educators we need to come up with more tools in our toolboxes to be able to help them do that and obviously taking kids outside more often i mean we're all on the same page with that one but you know it's like that movie yes day i just want to be able to say yes more often to the kiddos that are sitting in front of us um and that there isn't like no don't do it that way no don't do it that way no you must do it this way no the answer is yes yes you can do it yes 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 um and so i just kind of wanted to pop that in there but also just one last thing is 
uh, we were in the meeting last night and I knew this conversation was going to be very profound today. And my expectations of this have uh, been blown out of the water. So thank you so much to Libby and Karen and, and Jack for sharing your stories. And um, yeah, I think it's really opened up a lot of us in this room to be able to sort of reflect back on our own childhoods and realize that maybe the things that were said to us were maybe not as comical or not as funny, or maybe they did trigger something in us as adults and also as parents who are now trying to deal with you know, our own kids and, and the struggles that they have and sort of moving our way through that and giving this a, a space that we can sort of just, you know, like Avea did that really great um, thing in the chat was just kind of get rid of some of that. So I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for doing that. It's really sort of made me think and made me think also that, you know, maybe it is just the way that my brain works. I'm not a highly emotional person. And I always think that there's something wrong with me for that because I'm not a crier. I'm not like, I sometimes don't know what to do in those situations. And then I'm like, you know, after this conversation, I'm like, that just might be who I am. Like, it's not a character flaw. It doesn't mean that I'm not empathetic. It doesn't mean that, you know, you're not caring, uh, supportive. It's just like, you just may just may not be one of those people who like cry, right? Or get the tears always. Um, so it's it's been very enlightening for me as an individual in this group as well. So anyways, that's all I just wanted to say. Thank you, Billy Joe. Um, and I see Jack, you're raising your hand too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Laura, I had uh, another thought. Uh, Beth Bethany was uh, mentioning uh, camera uh, luc lucidus and um, this is is one you have a little clamp that you can put on a table and then you look through this little lens and um, you can see the object that is in front of you and you also see your piece of paper at the same time and if you would like uh, to see if this works for you um, send me your address i will mail this to you and here's the way it would work that that if this, I, I, I haven't really been using this. If you use this and you go like, dude, this is cool. I'm going to use this. This is now yours. Okay. If you use it and kind of go like, nah, it's not for me. And I'll just sit on a shelf. Then, then send it back to me. But if you, um, if, if, if this would be useful to you, um, then you get to keep it. Sound good? It, 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 you might have fun with it. So it, it'll come in a little package here and there's a, there's some, inst there's a little instruction book on how to use it. Um, I think you might have some fun with that. Oh, oh so we, we can allow you to unmute. Here we go. Cool. That's awesome. I uh, had actually looked at the thing that uh, the other thing that was look the acetate kind of thing, but I hadn't figured out how to hold it rigidly if I was outside because I'm out. I mean, most of the time I'm not at a window. So, I mean, that those are both something to sit that I could figure out how to use outside and inside. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Bethany, thank you for all of those really cool ideas. Um, so, um, E had made a request that maybe could you put that again? Um, <clears throat> the thing that that um that you just showed into the chat. Oh, um, yeah, do that. Okay, awesome. Um, does anybody else? Have any other questions or thoughts that they would like to share? Oh, perfect. Thank you, Jack. Leo Neo Lucida. Neo Lucida. Um, does anybody else have any other questions or thoughts that they would like to share um, before we close for today? I'm gonna go to the gallery view just to take a little look. Oh, I see, I see Marie. Please join us. Hi. Um Today, I was not sure I would join uh, this discussion. I'm so glad I did. Thank you so much, everybody who uh, spoke. Uh, next week, I will initiate two groups of uh, 
uh, students to nature journaling. It will be my first time and it will be their first time too. And um, your stories really touch me deeply and uh, I'll be aware of the diversity in those groups. So thank you so much. You opened my mind like you have no idea. Thank you, Marie. Um, I see a lot of people requesting in the chat that we have a part two to this conversation. Would that be agreeable? Yeah? Excellent. Um, this felt so healing to me. We should do a part two because it's like therapy. I swear I, can, I should be paying you all for the <laughs> opportunity to process all of this stuff. This is great. We would love to have a part two. We will definitely. Oh, go ahead, Karen. I would love to have an opportunity to give more specifics about things that I have found um, working with my kids and, and what they have taught me about the different um, kind of neurodivergence that, that is out there and uh, the, uh, the, the places that we have met and the solutions that we have found to, uh, to make things accessible and interesting for them. So, so yeah, I want to talk more about my kids. <laughs> Absolutely. That, that, thank you so much um, for, for joining us today, both Libby and Karen, and thank the two of you and Jack, thank all three of you for sharing your experiences and everybody who contributed to this conversation. I saw a question about getting um, a written list of tools. Laura um, asked that question. Absolutely, we can do that. Um, I had also seen questions earlier on about, about links and resources. Um, there's a document that I've been keeping and working on now for a while um, that I want that I'm, I'm hoping is already accessible to everybody here. But if not, then please let me know so I can make make sure you all have access. Um, it's a resources document for the Nature Journal Educators Forum, where we put all of these resources together so that people can access them in one place instead of having to search through a bazillion Zoom chats, which is what I'm currently doing to make this resource happen. Anyways, um, so I'd like to make sure that all of you have access to this. I am going to gather that um, in, I'm gonna gather that while we are closing up, but while I'm gathering it, I wanted to invite Jack and Karen and Libby, any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave us with before we go? I guess I'll start. Um, I went. I went. I got to go last last time, so I'll I'll, I'll pop in first here. Um, I'm feeling uh, deep gratitude. I'm feeling deep gratitude for uh, the the honesty and the depth of what you chose to share with us. Um, that gives me much greater insight, makes and actually changes the way I see myself. Um, and will change the way that I, I see students that I work with. Um, you made a, you moved the needle in my brain and I'm really grateful for that. Um, I also am really grateful uh, to you, Avea, for, uh, for the way you chose to host this, making sure everybody had opportunities to, 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 to share deeply your idea to let things go and let things in, I think was also a moment that we we needed at exactly that time that was uh, a, uh this is, has been such a useful uh, discussion so thank you so much also billy joe in the background there you've been checking the the, the chat and 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 monitoring things thank you also so much for uh your your help and support i'm feeling gratitude thank you I'm going to echo the gratitude. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for this community, for the resources that we have available from each other, with each other. Um, just the unlimited support that this community has. And I am very much looking forward to having my Wednesday afternoons back in another three weeks 
so I can actually be a regular part of the forum again. Um, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to do this. And uh, yeah, just such deep appreciation and, and all the love for this community and the people who, who make these uh, sessions happen behind the scenes and uh, on screen as well. Thank you. And uh, I couldn't say it better than the two of you already did. It means so much to me to find these kindred spirits and to have everybody sharing so authentically and uh, and to have this, this really safe, like healing community just all in the room together today, so unexpectedly in such a healing space. So it was more than I could ever have hoped for. Thank you so much for letting me be involved. Thank all three of you for being here. Um, <clears throat> before we close, I promised that I would share resources because I wanna make sure that we have ways of keeping these resources. I've put the link into the chat, but I'm also going to show on my screen what this resource list looks like. This is for everybody. Um, so this is, um, sorry, this is page five. Um, page one, Nature Journaling Educator Forum Resources for Nature Journaling Educators. Any of you who want to add to these resources can, and any of you who want to use these resources can. Um, this is all of us putting this work together. Um, Let's see here. There's a lot of different categories. There's get connected resources, ways of finding each other here in this community, as you can see. I apologize for my scrolling. I, I'm hoping it's not too fast. Mm -hmm. There's educators forum recordings. There's more than just this. There's an overall playlist. But if you're looking for specific topics, then we have those and there'll be more to be added. So nature journaling in a school setting, in a community setting, online, natural phenomena, weather and seasons, um, metacognition, this list is going to grow, how to's teaching specific techniques with diverse groups. There's going to be more here too. Um, there was, there was one earlier about elders who I'm going to put in here and a bunch of others. And this, this conversation will go here too, with your permission. Um, resources for students or participants in crisis from our discussion a few months back. Um, people have been giving me resources, which I deeply appreciate. So this is for our, when our students are in crisis and there's a whole bunch of others featuring educators or by educators websites, used by educators, articles, books. We're going to be adding to this list quite a lot. Um, online activity books, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion resources, accessibility device ideas for participants for all different kinds of accessibility, tools and supplies, nature appropriate gear, class web services, webcams, you get the idea all of them. So if anybody has any resources that they'd like to add to this, or if you see a category that does not yet exist, please create this. This is for all of you, all of us. Um, also within books, um, there are, let's see here, there's Bookshare Joy Lists. That's going to be one of our topics this summer. Um, Lindy Shepard has created a living book list. Rebecca Rolnick's created a book list. So uh, there's also this one from the first ever Wild Wonder Teachers Conference, which are all of the awesome children's books in my library, plus others because we're obsessive with books. If you're a book addict like the rest of us, join us. Anyway, um, all of that rambling to say that this is for all of us. And we're really thankful that you're all here with us today. And thank you. Thank you for all your strength and sharing with us and for giving us the opportunity to do better by our participants and by our colleagues and our friends. Okay. Love you all very, very, very much. I'm going to go to gallery view so we can all shoot hearts at each other. Y'all take good care. Thank you, everybody. And take care and stay safe. <laughs>